it's all about. See, I'm the legend, I'm the man, I'm the second longest streak in NBA history. Consecutive eight field goals. Daniel Gafford wants him to raise the roof in with good reason. <laughs> Six-year vet, center for the Mavs, joining us now, Daniel Gafford. And see, everybody jinxed you, Daniel. I, I wanted to tell you, we spent so much time talking about the 33 consecutive field goals yesterday, and you were going for Wilt's mm. record of 35. I thought it was so cool. And then you missed it. Oh, okay, talk yeah. to me. Did you, uh, how much was it playing in your mind, by the way, when you took the floor? Did anybody say anything to you? Uh, when I first got out, like you, it's funny how you say you jinxed me because I think uh, Shea jinxed me a little bit too. <laughs> uh, he he's like a former AAU teammate of mine, and we joke around most of the time when we play against each other. So he came up to me before the game, like during tip off. He was like, "Man, you gonna try to break the record against us, huh?" <laughs> and I think it just kind of played out from there. You know, it was a real exciting day for me, though. You know, at the end of the day, I just got in a position, just whiffed it at the end, whiffed it at the beginning there. And it, it was tough. It was tough. <laughs> I mean, it's got, it'd be hard not to think about it when the whole world's just watching and yeah. waiting. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. That is All true. Right, look, I got, it was Will kids and stuff just like in OKC and everything that was just like, oh, yeah, go beat Wilt's record and stuff. They was asking for autographs and everything. I was like, I'm going to try. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> oh. All right, you got. You know what? You can just do it again. It's no big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, Wilt's got other records. Mm -hmm. 100 points in a game. Maybe we do that. That, ooh, that's a, that's a big <laughs> ass for, for my position, but I, I give it a shot, you know. <laughs> All right. I like the positive energy. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Gap, is there a small part of you that's happy that this is behind you? Um, you know, as you got closer, obviously, it seems like it started to play a little bit more. People were coming up to you, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's fans, mm -hmm. other players, teammates. Um, and did it impact your shot selection at all? I mean, I didn't see you. I didn't see you take any threes, but you were doing your thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> shot selection, not necessarily. At the end of the day, you know, I, I dunk everything pretty much, you know. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't really anything too serious when it came to shot selection. I was a little bit nervous, like, the last two games when I was getting closer to it. So it's like every time that I was going to sleep or anything like that, I'm just, I was just having to force myself to kind of think about something else. At the end of the day, because, you know, I, I, I was just like wired. I was juiced. I was ready to go. I was anxious. I was nervous. <laughs> I was excited. It was just like a bunch of emotions all in the one. Man, most of your shots are, are assisted by Luca or Kyrie. You got to tell me, what's it like mm -hmm. to share the court with those type of guys to be able to play with them? And yesterday I mentioned on the show, I said, yo, he's eating off the land. And by eating off the land, you got two <laughs> of the most dynamic guards that you could play pick and roll basketball with, dump offs. Hey, you've been able to yo, break yo. records, score the ball at a high clip. What's it like playing with those guys and from mm -hmm. a game-to-game -game basis? What's it like playing with them and watching them cook? I mean, in all honesty, it's, it's a real great experience for me. I'm grateful to be in the position that I'm in today to be playing with just two great players. And, like, just when I came in, you know, just guys on the team were just telling me to just, you know, do, do the things that I'm usually always doing, send screens and going for lobs. And I always made sure that, especially, like, when I come to teams like this, make sure I at least pick the brain of the two main guys that I'm going to be sharing the floor with. And, you know, they told me the things that they don't like. They told me the things that they do like. So it's just like I have to be in the right spot at the right time. And the experience of seeing the things that they do on a night-to-night -night basis, it's just, it's unbelievable, you know, and I'm just blessed to be able to sit on the sideline and experience most of the time when I'm not on the floor. When I'm out there on the floor, I just make sure I don't, I don't mess up too much, you know, get them down here, get them to their spots, you know, because it's tough when you, when you got, you know, the two best guys on the floor getting on you about, you know, the things that you usually would do on a night-to-night -night basis. So I just got to make sure that I'm locked in 100% and just go finish around the rim. Those are the main things. Gaff, yeah, your former teammate, Kyle Kuzma, he said you have the easiest mm. job in sports. Do you agree? A hundred percent. You know, I just I just go light a guy up, just go hard to two of our best players, and I run to the rim at the end of the day. And if they get doubled, you know, I make sure I stay around and give them an outlet. But other than that, I rebound the ball, block shots, come out with energy, and be the anchor for the, on the defensive end at the end of the day. And offensively, just set screens and roll to the basket. So paint the picture for those of us who will never share a floor with Luca. What is it like? I mean, they say head on a swivel and we take that for granted, but mm. it would seem with him, you, you really have to do that. Oh yeah, for sure. Because it doesn't really matter where you are on the floor. He's always going to find you, whether you're in the corner, top of the key, and he's driving down to the basket. You could be in any position possible on the floor and there's going to be some type of way he gets the ball to you, <laughs> whether you're big, 
another guard on the floor sharing the floor with him, the three man, the four man, whatever. So it's just like, yeah, you have to keep your head on the swivel. You have to always have your hands ready, be shot ready. Because, you know, sometimes <laughs> sometimes if you miss a shot, if he has tries to assist you, he's gonna he's gonna try to get on you, you know, at the end of the day. But it's just it's just dope because he puts so much trust in his teammates and he tries to make everyone better on the floor from just like the position that I'm seeing at the end of the day. So I mean like I said, the experience is Playing with him and seeing the stuff that he does on a night to night basis is unbelievable. And I can stay consistent with him for so long is just something else that I'm trying to get to a point to be able to do too. Consistency is a big thing for me and just seeing how he holds himself and how he's consistent with everything he does on the floor, that's for sure like something that is contagious throughout the team. Is there a pass that sticks out to you that, that he's done that you sort of remember more than others. I thought the one the other night, the nutmeg with Clay Thompson was cool, but then I was educated oh, yeah. by both Lou and Chandler <laughs> that that's not that big a deal. Uh, do, what was uh, that one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. That is, that's, that's a bit of a regular pass coming from him in all honesty. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, yeah, there's no, I would say there's no passes that's really surprised me more than just like a full court pass that he's throwing me. If our contestant shot on a three-point uh, three line and he gets the rebound, he just launches it. You know, to have trust in a big man to be able to make the pass like that, that's that, that, that says a lot, you know, at the end of the day. I just got to make sure that I catch it. When I played wide receiver in ninth grade and I couldn't catch a cold. So catching those <laughs> passes like that is something that, you know, it's like, okay, I got to get better at this because I'm going to get these more often. Than <laughs> oh, man, you're having flashbacks. It's, it's, it's like it's a weird yeah. one. All right. Um, yeah. Luca and Kyrie. Can we talk Luca and Kyrie for a second? Because, I mean, Kyrie sort of has an air of mystery to him. And we see Luca's personality mm. shine through a little sarcasm. What are those dudes like off the court? Uh, they real down earth people, you know. It's just, it's just <laughs> you really expect. Like when I first got around Kyrie, I was expecting him to kind of be a little bit more. I would say, like you said, on the mysterious side. But once I got to actually sit down and talk to him, it's just like he's just a regular person, you know. Without the NBA status, he'd just be just like you know, regular person, just like anybody else. So it's dope to just kind of like pick the brains of guys like him. Luca, he's pretty chill, you know. Me and him are the same age, so it's just like. It's just like, man, you know, I, I feel old just because it's just like how my mentality is. I have, I have a real old soul. So it's just like sitting around Luca, he's real quiet. He reminds me of a young me, like a young, young me at the end <laughs> of the day, because every time that I've seen him, he's either on the phone playing cards or he's he, he sit down just looking at stuff on his Instagram feed. So it's just dope. They both real down to earth guys and they don't really do too much off the floor. Hmm. Gaff, you started your career with the Bulls. <laughs> How do you kind of look back at, at that start for you? And then you ended up in D.C. Now you're in Dallas. And how do you view the three cultures that you've been a part of? And, and you know, the, obviously, I'm sure it's night and day playing for the Wizards this year versus the Mavericks. But yeah. how do you kind of reconcile with the culture that you've been a part of so far in your career? Oh, man, each and every one of them, just like the fan bases, the organization, and everything was welcomed in with open arms. You know, Chicago, of course, it it took its toll. There's a lot of things that I felt like I took for granted in that situation whenever I was there with that team. I got traded to Washington, and I had to take another step in just like my career and how I wanted to blossom in the league. And, you know, I was there for three years, made a lot of great friendships, great relationships with a lot of people on the team, the organization, in D.C., and to be put in the position that I'm in now. I mean, it was just kind of like when I got to Washington, just come in and just be me. At the end of the day, they gave me the freedom to pretty much just do anything that I needed to do to be able to help the team win at the end of the day. So, I mean, coming here, I'm back close to home in Dallas. I'm like four to five hours away from my hometown. Uh, shout out to El Dorado. If anybody's watching it from down there, I know they're going to be mad if I don't. Um, but it's just, you know, each one of the cultures, it's not been too different. But at the end of the day, they always made sure that they, you know, walk with the new guys in with open arms. And I really appreciate that. Just being a guy that's, you know, been on three different teams now, just being on this team, I just feel like, you know, the love just was like continuously from just the, from the Chicago team to the Wizards team to now Dallas. Just the love is, you know, through the roof. And I appreciate it 100% most of them. I know you're not invested in it no more, but, you know, you played in D.C. four seasons. That was a tough stretch. Um, what do you think it takes for, for the Wizards to be a winning organization? Do you think they have what it takes to be a winning organization? Oh, 100% thinks that they have what it takes. At the end of the day, it just falls down to just like a level of consistency and something that we were just getting to before I got traded was just like the level of accountability with everybody on the team at the end of the day. 
day. We came out night in, night out. We were trying to figure it out. But one thing that we never did when I was there was just like, you know, I always come in and it's like, man, we don't know what to do. So we just gonna kind of give in night in, night out. We just gonna come out and just lay down, let everybody beat up on us at the end of the day. We always had plans on how to at least try to come out and make some type of fight on a night to night basis. And that's something that I see them trying to get to, you know, these next coming years when it comes to the organization trying to rebuild and trying to find just like their niche in the league, you know, because I mean, a couple of years before we were, I had made the playoffs when Russ was there when I first got there. And then I think the year after we were close to at least trying to make a play in birth. So at the end of the day, like, you know, when I was there, we told them ourselves, you know, we for sure like put ourselves in position to succeed. It's just, you know, on a night to night basis, we just kind of like had, couldn't figure out how to just like finish out a lot of stuff at the end of the day. You know, so like I said, it's just, you know, the accountability part, once they take the steps in the right direction from when I left, I'd seen that it's just, you know, when BK, he became the head coach and stuff, he really just kind of like changed, I would say, the scenery and the atmosphere with just how he wanted everybody. He wanted everybody on the team, how he wanted people to act, so on and so forth. So any show that covers NBA these days has to have a fashion segment. It has become a part Mm -hmm. of the game, one that I cherish. Mm -hmm. And on the Kyle Kuzma side of things, did you ever look up and say, <laughs> what in the hell are you wearing, sir? <laughs> What's yeah, going I, on I, with I stopped, Kyle Kuzma? <laughs> I, I, stopped worrying about, uh, I stopped worrying about cool stuff once he did the pink sweater. I was like, yeah, I don't even want to ask questions at this point. <laughs> you know? Oh, the giant pink oh, sweater I mean, with the sleeves? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one, that one, that one got me. I was like, yeah, because I, I had seen a couple before he had came to the Wizards, and it was just like, okay, you know, he has one of those fashion, kind of like Russ at the end of the day. It wasn't, it wasn't where Russ was at at the time when I first had seen it, but, like, now, <laughs> once I seen the pink sweater thing, I was like, yeah, it's, it can't get no worse than this. <laughs> and then okay. um, I seen the big, yeah, I seen the big um, bubble jacket that he wore the day we had went to play Brooklyn, if I'm not mistaken. And the collar of the jacket was like at the top of his head. I was like, bro, what are you doing? <laughs> God, I love it. Uh, I love it so much. Oh, he man. gives us stuff. <laughs> and where does he no, keep he it? He has All a right, different so sense of it. He does. Is he getting those made? Is he have, does he have a stylist? Like, how does that work? I don't know. He, he's real big in fashion and he tells his stories all the time with just like all the stuff that he wears and whatnot you know i was like yeah man that's that's cool you know but some of this stuff (laughs) some of this stuff is getting outrageous you know it takes up a lot of space in your locker i mean thank you you can't fit in there that's a great point the jacket alone needs its own locker um speaking of outfits maybe you could help (laughs) us and explain the following i will show you Mm -hmm. right now as we roll up some images what's going on here Uh, so, <laughs> so my style is be yeah, I put this together, of course. Really? <laughs> What's up with the mask, yeah, dog? So, um, <laughs> that Pirates of the Caribbean? So the mask, in all honesty, I was expecting the mask to have something when it came to just like up top with my hair. When I first like decided to put it on, I did not know it was going to be an octopus mask at the end of the day. And I just, <laughs> you know, he, I, <laughs> I sent it to I sent it to my stylist before I head out of the door before every game. And he's like, yeah, man, swag it out. Swag it out, look cool. And I was trying my best to put like the most serious face I could possibly put on with this mask on because I just knew, I just knew it was going to get a lot of, it was going to get a lot of like sideways looks because, you know, everybody, everybody didn't even know it was me at the time because no. it was just like my what first kind of, time kind of, kind of like dressing though? up. I'm digging the hoodie though. I'm looking for that hoodie. What kind of hoodie? Is I that? can't. I can't even. Um, I can't even remember what who had sent it to me. If I'm not mistaken, I can't. My stylist had did it, um, but it's. Gotta I think it's a company not too far from here. If I'm not mistaken, I'll for sure find it. You know, and get it to you. I got you. <laughs> but not you, Lou. You can't wear the hoodie without the mask. The mask is vital. Nah, I'm gonna leave a mask at home. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that to D. I'm gonna leave that to DG. I'm gonna leave a mask at home. But I, I love that hoodie though. That like hoodie I, told, I, I told him I was like I appreciate the mask, but we for sure like I, I've worn hats with like long ears on it before. I was like, yeah, let's keep it. Let's keep it with the ears. You know, you did it. <laughs> yeah, the octopus. You did it. You know, it's, <laughs> octopus. That's, octopus is a bit different. I felt like a wrestler coming out, uh, getting ready for Royal Rumble, man. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Not awful either. Uh, <laughs> No, not at all. <laughs> so, Gap, in high school, you played the drums for in, in the marching band. What was that like? Yeah. I mean, you had to have been the biggest drummer in, in high school history, marching I, band history. I was. Uh, 
Do you still play the drums? <laughs> uh, are you gonna start yes. an all hey. NBA rock band? Oh. Oh, yeah. oh, y'all done brought back the OG video. That's what started yeah. it all, man. <laughs> but um, no, like when I when I when I get to a point to where it's like I'm fully settled um, with just everything here in Dallas, I'm for sure gonna try to get back to it. My wife, she's been on my butt about it for the longest. She's like, yeah, you need to get back with music, so and such and such. Because I play music all the time around the house, and she just gets mad because you know I put so much energy to, into energy into it when it comes to me listening to it. So it's like, yeah, she be like, if you don't lock in. You know, some some bad gonna happen to you. I was like, oh yeah, let me go ahead and get right. But <laughs> just yeah, was most definitely like one of the tallest guys that was like out of the blue, you know, playing the bass drum, marching down. My cousin was in the band, he played the snare drum, he was always right beside me. So when I first started doing it, it was just something that, you know, I wanted to try out, see if I was gonna get better in it. Um I started off with just like the clarinet, played three different variations of the clarinet. Uh, so it was regular one bass clarinet, contra bass clarinet. So I was getting better over time when it came to the concert seasons where we had to sit in a chair and hold the instrument. I was getting better over time too when it came to the marching band stuff. I wanted to play the snare drum, I'm not gonna lie to you. I wanted to be on just like the smallest drum as possible. But it was like, no, oh, we're gonna put the biggest drum on your shoulders and we're gonna see what you do with it. <laughs> yeah, they're not gonna waste that. By the talents. way, were you, were you first chair yeah. clarinet? Like how good were you at clarinet? Um, I, I, I was terrible at the first one. Um, and then I, I got to a point to where I, I sucked at trying to get high notes. So I went to the bass clarinet, which was, it kind of got like the tone and stuff kind of got lower as I like upgraded with the clarinet. So I got to contra bass clarinet. That was the third variation of it that I played. And every time we went to regionals, regionals and stuff, I can't even talk. Um, I was always just like the only one that was playing that certain clarinet. So I always had made it. So it's like, I don't even oh, know yeah. if I was like the best of the best or if anybody else just didn't want to play this big clarinet at the end of the day. <laughs> it counts, man. It counts. By the way, fellow band nerds, so yeah. I appreciate the stories. I, I, I love it. All saxophone, much cooler instrument, but we won't have uh, to argue course. about that here. Uh, oh, Daniel yeah. Gafford, <laughs> Dallas Mavericks. It's going to be a hell of a stretch down these final weeks, Daniel. Best of luck all the way. And thank yeah. you. Thank you all yeah. so much. All right, running back. We'll be back. Run it back. Run it up.